much. Anyhow. Um, all right, grieving the seasons of our lives. Let me, let me give you a little theology here that lays a foundation for what we're going to do. Um, you know, I teach divine healing, uh, which is, uh, I, I believe Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I believe that healing is for today. I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Um, I, I believe that uh, the church should be a place where the supernatural is part of what we do, part of what we expect. Um, I think what's happened in our culture is that uh, uh, many churches have reacted against the abuse of the Pentecostals, and we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, I, I think, you know, we need the gifts of the Spirit. We need tongues. We need prophecy. We need healing. Uh, we need to do it in a healthy way. We need to be naturally supernatural. We need not to let be weird for being weird sake, okay? Uh, but we need to believe in the supernatural and, and believe God wants to do it. So I, I teach on the power of God. I'm going to tell you stories about uh, some amazing healings. Uh, even just this week, uh, one of the girls in my class was healed. Um, uh, you know, supernaturally, God touched her. It was, you know, she stood up and gave testimony. Uh, yesterday, when I was driving down here, I was going through this neighborhood looking for coffee. Um, I was on a search for cold brew. Um, cold brew coffee, not a cold brew. Okay. <laughs> Sinner. Okay. <laughs> and uh, actually, what I was really looking for was cold brew nitro. You know what nitro is? Uh -uh. Oh, this is good. It's cold brew coffee infused with nitrogen, and it comes on tap. But it's not alcohol. Relax. It's coffee. But anyhow, it's really good. So I, I, was, I was looking for some good coffee. And I see um, this van that says Grace Church Cleveland. And it was at this lady's house. And two of my students were on staff there. So I stopped thinking it was one of my students. It was their youth pastor. And they're doing a fundraiser. And they're helping this lady. And this woman comes running up to me and said, Ron, when you and Wanda were at our church, do you remember that I couldn't move my shoulder and you guys prayed for me. I was completely healed. Look, and I'm out here working because God healed me. We'd been at Grace Church last fall. So again, I, I believe in the supernatural. I believe we need to have a theology of power. Okay? But we also have to have a theology of pain. Okay? So there are some churches, they have a well-developed theology of power. Okay, Pentecostals. But if you don't get healed, it's because you don't have enough faith, or there's sin in your life, and they blame people. Okay? So they have this theology of power, but they have no theology of pain and suffering. And then there's other churches that have a well-developed theology of pain and suffering. They can help you die, but, and they're really good at it, but there's no power, okay? So what I would argue is that you've got to have both, a theology of power and a theology of pain and suffering. Um, because not everyone we pray for is going to be healed. Nobody bats a thousand this side of heaven, uh, because the kingdom of God has come, but it's not yet here in its fullness. We're not home yet, okay? And if you don't have a theology of grieving, you will give up on your theology of power. Because the first time you pray for somebody and they're, they're not healed, you're like, I'm not doing that again. You see, well, I mean, we do the same thing. Well, if my kid doesn't turn out right, I'm not going to do that again. No, you can't abandon. We're going to suffer loss. We're going to experience loss. So my argument is you have to have a well-developed theology of pain and suffering and know how to grieve your losses so that you don't give up on your theology of power. Okay? So, here's my starting premise in this talk. My starting premise is this. We must grieve the painful losses of the past seasons of our life before we can effectively embrace the present and the future. Okay? So, here's the issue. When, when I talk about grieving, most of you immediately go to death or the loss of a loved one. But I want to suggest to you that you're, you're experiencing loss every day. And, and most Christians don't deal well with loss. We pretend we're fine. We bury it. We push it down. And, um, and the result is our loss from our past season robs us of our present and our future. And I think it cuts off our spiritual growth and spiritual formation. And so to grieve or to mourn, simple definition means to express sorrow. To get what's on the inside out to the surface. Okay, uh, to bring the pain, the disappointment, the frustration uh, out of the silence, out of the hiddenness, and, and out into the open. 
Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who bring what is on the inside out to the surface, for they will be comforted. Okay, now, the minute I say this, all the men are going, does that mean I need to cry? Okay. Well, if you're asking that question, you probably do need to cry. You could probably use a good cry. Because men don't typically deal with this well. I mean, when the Steelers lost to the Jaguars in the first round of the playoffs, I was sitting with my friend, and I didn't say, I just need to go have a good cry. <laughs> now, I wanted to, but you don't say that. Ah, we'll get him next year. Ah, you know. And, uh, and, and to be honest, I had to learn about this from my wife. Because women tend to process their loss better than us guys. Okay? Now, men, no, that doesn't mean you necessarily need to cry, but you do have to find ways to get what's on the inside out to the surface. Okay? So I'll give you an example. Um, when Juan and I were married 10 years, it was our 10-year anniversary, and we were living in Northern California, and I took her away for the weekend. I took the weekend off church. We went to Mount Shasta, which is a beautiful mountain in Northern California. We stayed at a bed and breakfast that was incredible. On Saturday morning, I got her up early, and we went on a hot air balloon ride over Mount Shasta. Yeah, I was an amazing husband. <laughs> I was, take notes. I was good, okay? I mean, we just had a great weekend. We went to a beautiful restaurant, you know, and all that. It's just awesome, awesome weekend. We're driving home on Sunday afternoon, and she says, Honey, on the drive home, would you mind if we listen to this cassette tape, tells you how long ago it was, by a marriage counselor? I'm thinking, I am the most amazing husband in the world. Why do we need a marriage counselor, you know? And that's what I was thinking. I didn't say it. I went, sure, no problem, hon. So she plugs in this tape by this counselor. I have no idea who it was. And he's talking about this concept. And here's what he says. Men, you don't know how to grieve yourselves. You don't know how to process disappointment. And what's worse is when your wife tries to process her disappointment, her loss, you try to fix her. And I'm like, yeah, we're men. That's what we do. We fix people. <laughs> Tim the Toolman Taylor, okay? And, uh, and, and this counselor says, men, when your wife says, could we talk about Kelly's behavior at school? Could we talk about this? Don't fix her. Just listen and make the appropriate noise at the appropriate time. Mm, uh, you know, and ask questions. How does that make you feel? Because she's saying she wants to talk about your daughter's behavior at school. But what she really wants to get out is, am I really a good mom? And I'm like, well, just say that. Yes, you're a good mom. Shut up. Uh, you know, <laughs> again, we don't know how to deal with that raw emotion as it's coming up. And so this guy's going on. Man, if you will listen and not fix anything for a half an hour. I'm like, half an hour, okay? And again, make the appropriate noises. And don't fake it or she'll know. And I'm like, how do you not fake it? Because you know? we don't know how to do this, okay? But if, if you'll listen at the end of a half an hour and you won't have fixed anything, she will say, thank you, honey, I feel so much better. And I look at her, and she's, by the way, she's crying, and I'm like, I don't do this very well, do I? And she goes, <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and really, at the end of a half an hour, when I don't fix anything, if I just let you get it up and out, you will actually feel comfort. And she shakes her head, yes. And then the counselor says, and men, if you will learn how to do this on a regular basis, you will get lucky more often. <laughs> and I looked at her, and she went, <laughs> and I rewound the tape and listened to it three times. Okay, I was going to learn tonight because I genuinely wanted to be a better husband. What I didn't realize was it was going to help me walk with Jesus in a better way. Okay, because this concept of grieving, I think, is essential to intimacy and spiritual health. Okay, so um, five important questions about grief. Number one. What brings about the need for grief? Why do we need to grieve? Well, there's a one-word answer. It's the word loss. When you experience loss in your life, it brings about the need for grieving. Now, again, um, I tell our doctoral students, I, I teach this at our, our doctoral level, and I tell them, often when I talk about grieving, everybody wants to go to the death of a father or the death of a mother or the death of a sibling. And, and those deaths are certainly losses, but here's what I want to remind you of. We actually deal pretty well with death as a form of loss. We actually allow people time to process death. You know, we're pretty good at that.
But it's the other losses that we don't read well. And Henry Nowen puts it this way. I love this quote from Nowen. He says, if there is any word that summarizes well our pain, it is the word loss. We have lost so much. Sometimes it seems as if life is just one long series of losses. When we were born, we lost the safety of the womb. When we went to school, we lost the security of our family life. When we got our first job, we lost the freedom of our youth. When we got married or ordained, we lost the joy of many options. Let me pause there for a minute. Okay. Um, so I had a young man. He was a senior at Nyack. This was a few years ago. And uh, he dated a lot of girls at Nyack. Um, he was somewhat of a player. Good guy. Um, but he finally met the girl that everyone knew was the best girl on campus for him. And in their senior year, they got together, and he asked her to marry him, and she said yes. And actually, everybody was thrilled for them both. It was a, it was a great relationship, good people. So he comes walking into the office area, and I'm sitting there, and he said, uh, hey, Ron, can I talk with you? And I'm like, yeah, congratulations. I hear you got engaged. He goes, yeah, that's kind of what I want to talk about. I'm like, what's wrong? He goes, I don't know. I'm depressed. I go, dude, I know the other girls you dated. You got the right one. And he goes, I, I don't know. I, I don't know why I don't feel more. And so I said, oh, okay, sit down. Shut the door. I said, I know what's going on here. Um, I said, I'm going to help you. We're going to have a talk. And it's just you and me. You're not going to have this talk with your fiance. Okay, this is your place of honesty. She's not going to be safe for this conversation. I said you need to grieve the loss of all the other options. Mm -hmm. And he goes, "Yeah, really? Is that okay?" Now, the minute I say this, I've had women go, "Oh, what a jerk!" Now, think about it for a minute. When you grieve, and I had him go through every one of the girls he dated, and he thanked God for them. But he also acknowledged why that relationship came to an end. And in Jesus' name, he blessed them, said goodbye, and shut the door. And we walked him through about an hour of doing that, through each of the relationships he's had. And he shut the door, and he said goodbye. Because when you grieve it well, and you say goodbye, then you leave that past relationship and that past season to fully embrace what God has next. And what happens when a guy doesn't close the door on all those past relationships? You understand? Suddenly, a girl shows up on Facebook that he hasn't grieved it and let it go, and the door opens up again. Okay? And so grieving says goodbye to a previous season so that you can fully embrace the next. So he, now he goes on and he says, when we grew old, we lost our good looks, our old friends, or our fame. Uh, when we become weak or ill, we lost our physical independence. When we die, we lose it all. And these losses are part of the ordinary life. But whose life is ordinary? The losses that settle themselves deeply in our hearts and minds are the loss of intimacy through separations, the loss of safety through violence, the loss of innocence through abuse. Okay, folks, let me say something. So I have 40 undergrad students, and they have to do a grief journal as part of their spiritual formation class this semester. 100% of them, either experienced sexual abuse as a child or early sexualization where they were robbed of innocence. 100% this year. It's epidemic. And they had to grieve that early sexualization, that loss of innocence, because it was a loss that was affecting them in some very deep ways. Okay? Uh, the loss of innocence through abuse, the loss of friends through betrayal, the loss of love through abandonment, the loss of home through war, the loss of well-being through hunger, heat, and cold, the loss of children through illness or accidents, the loss of country through political upheaval, the loss of life through earthquakes, floods, plane crashes, bombings, and diseases. Perhaps many of these dark losses are far away from most of us. Maybe they belong to the world of newspapers and television screens. But nobody, now catch this, nobody can escape the agonizing losses that are part of our everyday existence, the loss of our dreams. The bottom line is nobody gets out of life without loss. You see, nobody gets the life they thought they were going to get. Nobody. Uh, and so if you are constantly wanting something you don't have and you don't grieve it and let it go, then you, you live in a perpetual state of, of discontinuity with the life you have or with the children you have. Okay? Now, what I would say is that I don't think we just have to grieve painful 
losses. I think we have to grieve transitional seasons when we're leaving behind a good season. So, for example, when my first daughter went off to Eastern, we took her down to Philly. It's two hours away. We helped her set up a room. Uh, we prayed with her. We were excited for her. Like I said, she got a scholarship. Um, I didn't want her to stay home and work at McDonald's. I wanted her to go to college, right? You want your kids to go. It's a good thing. But when we walked out of her room and we're on our way to the parking lot, I started sobbing. And Wanda's looking at me, and I'm just, you know, I am just crying. I've lost my daughter. Honey, she, and Wanda's rationalizing. You know, no, you didn't lose your daughter. You just took, I mean, don't fix me. <laughs> <laughs> I had to preach at her. I go, no, just let me go. So we're driving back two hours, and I'd, I'd be okay for a little bit, and then, <sighs> then I'd cry. But, you know, it, it, I, I grieved it. Well, then, two years later, my son, he says, Mom and Dad, I want to go to college in Florida. And I'm thinking, 18 hours. I am not driving 18 hours and grieving 18 hours. <laughs> I said, Bryce, we'll pack your stuff. We'll ship it. We'll go to the airport. I'll grieve an hour back from LaGuardia. Okay? <laughs> That'll be enough. And he goes, no, Mom, Dad, I need that 18-hour drive to process the first 18 years of my life with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here's what happened. So we load the car. We get in the car at like 3 in the morning to start our trip to Florida. Wanda and Bryce sleep the first 12 hours. Okay? And so I'm driving alone through North Carolina listening to country music because that's all you can get in North Carolina. But it's okay because it's music to grieve by. You know? I lost my truck. I lost my dog. You know? And so, so I, I'm kind of grieving. In fact, and then this one song comes on. They're sleeping. And it's a woman, and she's singing, I need a man to stand beside me, not in front or behind me. It's a woman longing for a good man, okay? And now I'm crying because, yeah, God, I got three daughters. They need good men. Oh, God. You know, and I'm crying to this woman singing, I need a man to stand beside me. And Wanda wakes up, and she looks at me crying, and she listens to this woman singing, I need a man to stand beside me. <laughs> she was you're crying to this song? <laughs> Don't fix me. I'm so hormonal right now, okay? <laughs> so, I grieved it. But now listen. Because I grieved the end of a good season, I was able to fully embrace my last two daughters' high school experience. They were lacrosse players. I made every game. And I didn't become a helicopter parent. Mm. Now, a helicopter parent is a term we use on college campuses for parents that refuse to let go. And they show up on campus all the time, and it's unhealthy. Because if you don't grieve and let your kids go to a new season, then you will hold on in an unhealthy way. And you won't fully embrace what God has next. You miss the new season. Okay. So, second question. Why is grieving necessary? And maybe a better way of putting it is, what happens if we don't grieve? Okay, I hear you saying this, but nah, I don't know if I really need to do it. Well, two things will happen. First of all, if you choose not to grieve, you will first of all deaden your heart. You will come to the place where you say, if I don't hope for so much, maybe it won't hurt so much. And you begin to silence your dreams. Okay, And so I see seminary students, you know, they come to train for ministry. And they're excited about what God's going to do in their life. They're excited about ministry. Man, they can't wait to get out there and change the world for Jesus. And then I see them after five years. And they've been through one too many governing board meetings, okay? And they've had the tar kicked out of them. And they have sheep bites all over them. And sheep bites are the worst. They get infected. You know? Hurt people hurt people, okay? And I look at them, and all the light has gone out of their eyes. How you doing? How's your ministry? It's all right. Okay? And, and what's happened is they deaden their hearts and they give up on the dreams because they've had this dream killed and this dream killed and this dream killed. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. And when you give up on your hopes and you give up on your dreams, your heart becomes dead. And, uh, and so I've seen people that fail to grieve well give up on their dreams. Okay? Second thing that happens is they compartmentalize their lives. And that's where... They pretend everything is fine, 
but inside they numb their pain with all kinds of addictions. Folks, I think this is the place where pornography gets, addiction gets birth, where alcoholism, where drug addiction, where secret life kind of stuff begins to uh, go bad because we compartmentalize. And so, you know, I tell seminary students, look, if you don't grieve, you'll start numbing your pain in secret with all kinds of other things. It's called compartmentalization, okay? And so grieving is necessary, okay? Uh, my, my wife right now uh, is going through some grieving about some stuff. She's processing some stuff with our family, with her own position, uh, with stuff we're going through at NIAC. And uh, I keep going, I say, honey, let's go to the movies. Uh, you know, and she's been hesitant. Uh, let's, let's watch this. Let's do this. She's like, honey, I, I want to do that kind of stuff. But right now, God does not want me to numb my pain. And my wife doesn't numb her pain with drugs or alcohol. But, you know, sometimes what we do is we avoid our pain so that we don't have to deal with it. And, uh, and so she's, she's being pretty diligent about pressing into this season. She knows it's not forever. She knows it's going to launch her into what God has next. Okay? So it is necessary. Um, Brent Curtis puts it this way. Often what we do, instead of dealing with the arrows or our loss, is we silence the longing. That seems to be our only hope, and so we lose heart for how many losses can a heart take. And so what happens is we live in denial of our wounds. We try to minimize them. We tr try to pretend they're not as bad. But when we do that, we deny a part of our heart, and we end up living with a shallow optimism that frequently becomes a demand that the world be a better place than it really is. Okay? And that's that bounded set mentality, living in denial, you know, pushing it down. Uh, on the other hand, he says, there are some people that embrace their loss and arrows as a final word on life. We let the despair of our loss define us, and we lose heart and lose our future. And, and so there's two extremes on this. We either press it down, deny, and pretend everything's fine, or we just dive into it and we never emerge from it. Okay, we let it define us. And, uh, and we've got to learn to grieve so that we can move on. Third question. Um, why do we avoid it? Okay, so if we need to do it, if it's healthy, then why isn't everybody embracing it? Well, we don't like pain. We don't like pain. And I'm sitting here on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. This, you know, We could be golfing right now. We could be having fun. And I'm sitting here telling you that it may be necessary for you to revisit some of the most painful moments of your life. And some of you are going, no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, no, no, I, I don't want to deal with, I don't want to deal with what my mom did to me. I don't want to deal with my father wounds. I don't want to deal with the loss of my first marriage. I, I don't want, or if you're a pastor, I don't want to deal with what the church was like. But you see, the problem is when you don't deal with your losses, you end up reliving that history, and it owns you. And when I talk with pastors, you know, when they don't grieve well at previous church, then they live out of reaction. Whatever happens to them reminds them of what happened in a previous ministry. What happens in a new relationship triggers all your stuff from the old relationship if you haven't grieved it well, if you haven't processed it. And so we don't like pain. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is this. You cannot shut down your emotions selectively. And so when you go through that something that's painful, you go, oh, I'm not going to feel that. I'm going to move the wall in. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm going to shut that down. I don't want to feel that pain. I'm going to use workaholism. I'm going to use distraction. I'm going to use denial. I'm going to use all kinds of other things. I'm not going to feel that. But here's the problem. You can't shut down your emotions selectively. And so what happens is, while you're not feeling the pain, you begin to lose your joy also. And you begin to live with kind of a monotone existence, to use a, a, a musical term, where you're not hearing the low notes, but you can't hear the high notes either. And, and so you kind of just begin to lose your emotional capacity because you can't shut down your emotions selectively. And often, the only emotion we get comfortable with is anger. But anger is a secondary emotion. It's not primary. Okay. Tell you, let me tell you two stories about that. So my daughter, Karis, when she was about three or four, all of my stuff was starting to surface. And I needed some counseling. But I wasn't admitting it. And so the only thing that was coming up was anger that was disproportionate to what was happening. 
I was shutting down my pain, but I was also losing my joy. And so one night we're at supper. Karis is about three, maybe three and a half, just a little girl. And, uh, and we taught them well. We taught them to be healthy, and we, you know, we taught them to be honest, okay? And, and she spills her milk. And when she spills her milk, I lose it. And I'm like, Karis, what is wrong with you? I go into the parental shame question. And she looks at me, and she goes, what's wrong with me? I'm three. And I go, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> what's wrong with you, Dad? <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I went, oh, I need help. <laughs> Listen, but again, when you're, you're shutting down your emotion, you, you can't shut it down selectively, so you lose your joy, too. I was out in Omaha, and actually I was doing a, a seminar on worship. I wasn't even dealing with this stuff. I was talking about worship and celebration and different forms of worship. And this girl comes walking up to me, and she says, she says, can you help me? I have lost my joy and my passion in worship. And so would you pray over me? Would you just pray that the Lord restores my joy? I used to love worship. I had such passionate intimacy with God in the midst of worship, and it's gone. I don't feel joy anymore. And I said, well, no, I'm not going to pray for you. She goes, why? I go, I want you to tell me about your losses. What have you lost in your life? She got this horrified look. She goes, I don't want to talk about that. No, we need to. Because I can't just pray a joy anointing on you. i got to find out where you're shutting down your emotions because you've lost something significant and you haven't dealt with it well. And then she starts sobbing. Well, here's her story. I'll tell you in a nutshell. She had been dating a non-Christian guy. She got saved. He didn't. And all her Christian friends were like, you can't date him. You can't date him. You can't be unequally yoked. And so she broke it off with him. Because it was the right thing to do. But she never grieved it. Okay? And she just said, well, I did it for Jesus. I feel guilty grieving doing something that's right. And I looked at her and I said, did you love him? She said, I loved him more than life itself. Did he love you? He loved me. He would have laid down his life for me. No, he wasn't a Christian. But he treated me better than any Christian guy I've ever dated since. Which is kind of an indictment on us, okay? And uh, I said, you got to grieve this. Because yes, you may have done the right thing, but, but guess what? Jesus gives you permission to cry the loss and to grieve it. And so I, and his, her two friends were there, and they looked a little guilty. And I said, did you guys shame her into being quiet about this? And they went, and I said, now it's time to help her weep. And you go over here. I sent them over. And I said, you guys spend the afternoon greed, helping her greet the loss of that relationship. And so they did. They spent about three hours. That night, you should have seen her in worship. Because here's the deal. When you tear down this wall and say, I'm going to feel this, your joy gets unlocked too. That's why, have you ever noticed at funerals, even painful funerals, how much laughter there is afterwards? Because when you embrace the pain, it often releases joy too. I mean, when my father-in-law died two years ago, he was an incredible man. He fell down the stairs and broke his neck. It was a tragic end to his life. But he was able to live seven days until all seven of his kids got back, and they held hands, and they sang him into glory, which was the way he wanted to go out. And his funeral, I mean the stories and the laughter. And was it painful? It was incredibly painful. But we dove into the pain. We tore down that wall. We felt it. And in the midst of it, we felt incredible joy released too. Okay? And so that's what grieving accomplishes. All right. Uh, number four. With what options does our past pain leave us? Okay? Uh, now, some of you have done some study on this, and you've read the writings of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. She deals with grieving, and she talks about the stages of grief. And when you lose something, you go through anger, denial, rationalization... I'm not talking about stages. I'm talking about where do people camp out and live for the rest of their lives. Okay? And here's the options they choose. Hiding or denial. There are people that have been hiding and in denial of their loss their whole life. But the problem with that is it's like shoving a beach ball down under the water. When you shove a beach ball down under water, it comes up somewhere. It doesn't come up where you pushed it down. And that's what hiding and denial does, is you end up having problems physically, emotionally, other relationships. 
And so w when you choose hiding or denial, it affects you in other ways. And you don't always see it because, well, it's not surfacing where the loss was. No, but it's surfacing in other areas. And so uh, hiding or denial is not a good option. Uh, rationalization. Rationalization is when you say things like, what right do I have to grieve? I've had a good life. And you know what? I had a mom and dad who loved me. Yes, there was dysfunctional, but they weren't drug addicts and they didn't beat me and they didn't. And so we rationalize away our pain and our loss. In fact, I have to do this. When I teach on emotional healing, I have to grab Christian kids and say, would you stop the fake honoring your father and mother? You know what fake honoring is? Fake honoring is when you don't talk about your parents' deficiencies and their failures. And so we, we told our kids early on, look, we love you. And most parents start a college education fund. We're going to actually start a therapy fund. We'll pay for the first two years of your therapy because we know we wounded you, okay? And, and we're just going to be honest about it, okay? And we give you permission. But listen to me. None of us had perfect parents. And, and we feel guilty about being honest. We rationalize it away. But... You know, Tim knows my mom and dad. I had to process a lot of my dad wounds, my mom wounds. And you know what I found? I loved them more on the other side. Mm -hmm. And now when I spoke honor about them, I meant it. And I do mean it. I really, really love them. But I tell you what, I couldn't rationalize away some of the loss. I had to be honest about it. Okay? And so rationalization does not work. Uh, anger and bitterness. This is where, you know, we just kind of live looking for an opportunity to vent. And we have this in New York. I know you don't in Ohio, but we have this thing called road rage. <laughs> you know about road rage? It's not road rage until you get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, in New York, it's, it's weird, you know, because you know, I, I drive in New York all the time, and people are always pointing their fingers one way Jesus at me. <laughs> they use the wrong finger, okay? Um, you know, so it's just, ah, it's just it, Look, I just cut you off without using my turn signal. Lighten up, okay? But listen, this anger and bitterness, it, it's anger that's out of proportion for what happened. And what the reason for it is it's being driven by something much deeper that we haven't dealt with. And so that's one of the clues that I needed to get some help when my anger was coming up toward my kids. Addictions. Name your addiction, okay? Uh, workaholism, drugs, alcohol, food addiction. Uh, I, I tell you, food addiction was a big one for me. And um, I, I know people that have exercise addiction. I don't have that one. If you do, come and lay hands on me before you get prayed for. Uh, but, but listen, it's anything that we use to distract us. Ministry can be an addiction. Okay, uh, It can become an unhealthy addiction that, that uh, uh, is not good. So I think the only healthy option is biblical grief and mourning. Biblical grief and mourning. All right. Now it says this, yes, we must mourn our losses. We cannot talk or act them away, but we can shed tears over them. We can allow ourselves to grieve deeply. Now catch this. To grieve is to allow our losses to tear apart our feelings of security and safety and lead us to the painful truth of our brokenness. Now pause there for a minute. When I read that the first time, I went, why in the world would I want to tear apart my feelings of safety and security and here's why. Because your feeling and my feeling that we can keep ourselves safe, we can keep ourselves secure, is an illusion. And the only thing that is real safety, real security, is when our brokenness drives us to Jesus and we say, Jesus, you're my only hope. Only you can be my refuge in a time of storm. Only you can be the healer of my deep woundedness and brokenness. And, and so when you grieve, it removes the illusion that you're your own savior. You're a lousy Savior. So am I. He is really good at saving people and healing people. And so grieving drives us to him. It leads us to the painful truth of our brokenness. And in the midst of all this pain, there's a strange yet surprising voice of the one who says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's the unexpected news. There is a blessing hidden in our grief. Not those who comfort are blessed, but those who mourn. Somehow in the midst of our tears, a gift is hidden. Somehow in the midst of our mourning, the first steps of the dance take place. Somehow the cries that well up from our losses belong to our songs of gratitude. So, so what, what now is saying is 
that your best praise will be birthed in pain. See, we had a lady in our church. She got saved in California. She was a drug addict. She was a prostitute. She was a witch. She was, I mean, you name it, she was it. And when she got saved, she got like saved. Like saved, 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 okay? And when worship would start, she would dance over on the side. And somebody had given her a ribbon. And when the worship would start, she wouldn't draw undue attention to herself. She would just be over there on the side. She'd be waving that ribbon, and she'd be dancing. And one day a lady came up to me and said, Pastor, how long are you going to let this nonsense go on? <laughs> and I went, what nonsense? Well, that woman, she's a distraction. I go, why is she a distraction? Well, I notice her every Sunday, and she's just out of control. And I looked at her and I said, don't you dare judge that woman's praise until you know the depth of her pain. And when you sit with her, I started to cry. I said, when you sit with her and you listen to what Jesus has saved her from and you listen to the pain that she's walked through, then you understand why she is praising him like she is. But don't you dare judge her praise until you know the pain that she's been rescued from. She didn't. I think she left our church. <laughs> I'm sorry, every healthy body eliminates. So, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> All right. Last thing. Last thing. Let me give you a quick bullet list. Uh, this is kind of a summary. What are the benefits of biblical grief? Okay, number one, it helps us to live proactively instead of reactively. See, listen. When I grieve a painful ministry experience and I process it, then... When that experience happens again, I treat it proactively and not reactively. When I have a kid, and all, all my kids are different, okay? And I have one kid um, that if I didn't grieve the way she responded to me, then my son, who was very different, if I parented him reactively based on my stuff with Kelly, I would mess it up. And so I've, I've, I've got to grieve so that I can treat every situation proactively and not reactively, okay? And so that's one of the benefits of, of grieving. Secondly, it increases your emotional capacity to handle life and people more fully. So, you know, my theory of this, and I have a psychiatrist who's in seminary now. She's one of my students, and I'm asking her questions all the time to make sure I'm on base. When you grieve, it's almost like you have a release valve on your emotional tank. And you empty that emotional tank when you grieve. And it's kind of like when, when you get filled up with stress and you get to a place where you go, if one more thing hap happens, I'm going to lose it. That's when you need to process the pain and you need to grieve and you need to, you know, empty that release valve so that you have the emotional capacity to handle whatever life throws at you. Okay. Uh, three, grieving gives you the freedom and permission to risk again and set big goals. So listen. If you get burned in business, what happens is you start to live safe. And if you start to live safe, you can miss opportunities. When you get burned in ministry, you start to live safe. And when you start to live safe, you miss, you, you don't take risks. And listen, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. <coughs> and so when you get robbed of the ability to risk, you get robbed of faith. And, and grieving gives me the, listen, I need this. Because next year, Wanda and I are moving to Manhattan. We're getting rid of our house in the country, and we're going to go all in in New York City to try to bring a new level of renewal and transformation to our city campus. Folks, I'm a country boy. I grew up fishing and hunting in western PA. I cheer for the Steelers. I'm going to live in Manhattan. I'm scared to death. Some of you are going, ah, better you than me, okay? Listen. <laughs> But the only reason I can do that is I'm grieving, and I know, God, you're calling me to this, and so I'm going to take a risk, and I'm going to go for it. Okay, Grieving and leaving behind the previous season is what allows you to take risks Okay, and, and to dream big dreams. Uh, three, four, it keeps your heart soft. It gives you empathy for other people's losses, even when you haven't lost what they have lost. Okay, um, But if you're in touch with your own loss then when somebody goes through their own set of losses that you can't really relate to, your own heart is soft because you're freshly grieving what, what has happened to you. 
And, and so it keeps you soft and it gives you the ability to have empathy. Okay. Um, five, it restores your capacity to trust God and people again. Okay. Um, I saw a guy a few months ago and he had a shirt that said, trust God, love people. And I looked at him and I said, what does that shirt mean? He goes, that means only God is trustworthy. Only trust him. Just love people. And I went, wow, that's cynical. I said, i got to be honest. I don't think it's going to work for you. And he says, no, I'll never trust people. I only trust God. I'm like, wait a minute. That's not how we're to live. You can't live in community that way. Yes, people are going to wound you. Yes, people are going to hurt you. But you've got to grieve that. And you've got to live and trust. You know? And yes, they're going to hurt you again. But you've got to grieve it. Because you can't live with that kind of cynicism. It'll eat you alive, okay? And so when you grieve, by the way, some of you need to grieve some stuff you perceive God has done to you. Now, God is good. He doesn't need to be forgiven. I get that. But sometimes our perception of what has happened, we've laid at the feet of God, and we've got to grieve it. Remember, Jeremiah said, you've deceived me, O God. Remember the prophet saying that? No, did God lie to No. But Jeremiah felt like it emotionally. And he had to get it up and he had to get it out so that he could say, nevertheless, I'll trust you. So that Job could say, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. And the only way you get there is you've got to be honest about your pain. Okay? All right. So, in order to grieve your pain, you have to get in touch with your heart and your past pain. So, let me just tell you a story. Um, it was about 15 years ago. And I was at Delta Lake Conference Center up in uh, New York. It's a Christian camp up there, CMA camp. And I, I was preaching a sermon out of Lamentations. Which, by the way, Lamentations is a Greek journal. It's Jeremiah grieving the loss of uh, Jerusalem. And he's sitting in the rubble of, of Jerusalem and he writes Lamentations. A lament is a Greek, Greek journal. Grieving is all through Scripture, by the way. Read the Psalms. Uh, read Jeremiah, read the prophets, they're constantly grieving. Jesus wept, he grieved. Jesus grieved over Jerusalem, 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 I would have you know, gathered you as chick. Jesus grieved in the garden. I mean, there's grieving all through Scripture. Is this biblical? Absolutely. Okay. Um, but so I'm preaching on limitations, and at the end I give an invitation. And this woman in her 60s, probably late 60s, comes running to the front and she's sobbing. Okay, she's sobbing. And I see her husband walking, uh, following her. Well, he was a retired pastor. She's a retired pastor's wife. And Juan and I went over to pray with him. And when we went over, here's the story we heard. In their first church in Western PA, they were contemporaries with uh, our dad. Our, your dad and my dad knew them. Okay, And they were in their first church, and she was pregnant with their first child. And about four months into the pregnancy, quite a ways in, she miscarried. And, um, and, it, and it happened, I think, on a Tuesday or a Wednesday. And on Wednesday, the women of the church came over, and they were nice. They brought food. You know, they were very kind. They were very loving. Um, you know, they were doing really well. Until they left at the end. And this was Wednesday afternoon. And they're going out the door. And one of the women turned and said to her, Now, you will be in church on Sunday, won't you? Because nobody can play the piano but you, and we really need you to teach your Sunday school class. And she went, oh, oh yeah, I'll be there. And she realized that she had exactly, what, three days to grieve the loss of her child. But she didn't wait three days. She started working on the service and working on her Sunday school lesson, and that's where it ended. Okay? So now it's over 40 years later. She's had panic attacks her whole life. She had issues with her immune system. She had, she had this stuff popping up everywhere. And she'd known depression. And she, that service, the revelation came. She had never grieved that child. That week at Delta Lake, they named that baby. We had a memorial service for that baby. I can see her uh, letting a balloon go, saying goodbye to that little baby that they finally named after 40 years, okay? I've stayed in touch with that couple. They actually live down in Tacoa now, okay? And her anxiety's gone. The depression has been broken. 
the immune system stuff has been remedied. Why? Because it was connected to that. We're, we're holistic beings, folks, and we can't push stuff down in one area of our life and not have it affect everything else. But when she grieved it and processed it, when she got it up and out, the healing from the Lord came and the freedom. So, here's where I'm at. I, I, you know, I, know, I know we've got a little bit of time. I want to take a little bit of time. I want you to do something for me. I want you to do a little exercise. And you may need to get up and move, but let me tell you where, uh, what I want you to do. See, grieving is best done as a regular spiritual discipline, not just a one-shot deal, not just a 10-page grief journal. But um, it's best done on why? Because you're experiencing loss on a regular basis. So it needs to become part of your spiritual formation repertoire. Okay. Um, but what I want to suggest is to begin with a bullet list of your losses. What have I lost that's affected me? What, what do I need to deal with? Because some of you have tears that are long overdue. Okay. Um, and, and you can either start chronologically or wherever the most pain arises. Okay. Um, and, and don't stop when it starts to get uncomfortable or painful because that's usually a sign there's infection under the scalp. And, and some of you are like, no, 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 I already dealt with that. Why is the Lord bringing this up? Well, it's kind of like peeling an onion. You ever peel an onion? You peel an onion and the tears come, but you can let that onion sit for a few days and you can put it right next to your face and not cry until you go to the next layer. And sometimes that's what the Lord does. He goes, yeah, you went part of the way there, but I want you to go deeper on that. I want you to process that loss, okay? And, and then, to be honest, most of us, and I'm not anti-counselor, I think counseling can be helpful, but for this kind of stuff, most of us don't need a counselor. We don't need anybody to fix us. We just need somebody to listen, weep with those who weep, who won't fix us, who won't pray us into health and pat us to death, but just know how to weep with us and help us get what's on the inside out to the surface. Okay? So stand up for a minute. I know you're tired. It's been the afternoon. You've been a great audience. You'll get AIDS. Okay? Stand up for a minute. And then, um, here's, here's what I want you to do. Stand up and stretch, and then uh, pass out these papers and these pens. And I want us to take just a few minutes, and I want to pray for you. Um, and if you already have a journal or something, just use that. Or if you want to do it in your iPhone on the memo page, you can do it there. But I, I want you to, to not run from this moment too quickly. I, I want to intentionally kind of hold you here. Because you know what? When we hear a talk like this, we want to get to the next thing. Let's move on. Come on, Ron. Let's talk about healing. Let's talk about something else. Yeah. So, um, so what I'd like you to do is I want to pray for you. And I want, to take, I want you to take a few moments. Now, here's the thing. I give you permission to feel whatever you're feeling. You don't have to shove it down. You don't have to bury it. If, if, if it's up, it's okay. It's okay not to be okay. But I, I want you to take a few moments. And again, um, you may say, I, I want to I write down some bullets about my dad. My dad was never there. He never showed up uh, at my games. Uh, and I regretted that my whole life. And it, it may be that you want to write some of that. You might want to write some stuff down about your kids. You might want to write some stuff down about uh, something with work, uh, something, some dream you had for your business that just never came to fruition. Okay, but again, just just don't. If the Holy Spirit brings it up, just write it down, and then at some point process it. So, Spirit of the Living God, we you're here. And this is not fun stuff, God. But Lord, it does set us free. And we believe, Holy Spirit, that you would not be surfacing these tears that are long overdue, these memories that are painful, if you didn't want to bring your freedom to it. So come, Holy Spirit. Just feel free to have a seat. Have a seat and just uh, take a few minutes. We're going to take about 10 minutes, and then I'll pray for you, and we'll close. Just take about 10 minutes and just jot some things down. You might, you might want to write in prose, or you might want to just jot down a bullet list. There's no wrong way to do it. You know, some people have said to me, 
how do you grade a grief journal? C minus, you haven't suffered enough, okay? Um, no, the way I grade it is, are they getting honest? Are they, are they really going for it? Or are they just kind of mailing it in? So just, just jot down a few things, and then I'll pray in about 10 minutes and we'll be done. <laughs>